All right, we are in Psalm 41. The reason we are is because we're doing a series through the Psalms, not hitting every Psalm, but uh, I'm hitting Psalms that either Jesus quoted from or that are Messianic Psalms, Psalms that uh, speak of him as the Messiah. Psalm 41 is a Psalm you'll recognize uh, that Jesus quoted from. And the topic we're going to look at here, King David's frenemies and a close friend wish he would die from his sickness. The title of our message, with friends like these, you need Emmanuel. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for giving us the, the health actually to be here this morning and the, the opportunity and also, Lord, the will and the drive uh, both to be here in person and on li- uh, online because we need your word. It's essential to us. I, I know we can read it for ourselves. We can listen to uh, various studies and all, but there's a sense, Lord, uh, you know, that I think you've put in your word that for each particular local fellowship, the word that is taught has a prophetic aspect in our lives. Not that we're preaching prophecy or anything like that, but that you're able to use that word in a unique way in each unique fellowship. This is the word that you have for us. Not that it isn't valuable to study and search out your word in, you know, in other ways, but this is a special word that you have for us. Uh, and, and so we thank you, Lord, that your presence is here, uh, attending it. We pray for that anointing. Uh, it's necessary, Lord, because without it, uh, nothing will really matter. And so speak to us between uh, the soul and the spirit where only the word of God can get. Do it uh, according to your will. And we pray in Jesus' name and those who agreed said, amen. What is the first thing that pops into your head when I say comfort food? Mm. I didn't ask you to shout it out. <laughs> For me, it's a quarter to a half a pound plate of spaghetti, thick with marinara sauce covered with fresh grated Parmesan cheese, followed after a few hours by a generous slice of Grandma Mary's cheesecake. Who's Grandma Mary? My mom. There's a scene in the movie Signs where the family thinks they might be having their last meal before being overrun by the aliens. The little girl, Bo, wants spaghetti. Her brother Morgan wants French toast with mashed potatoes. Uncle Merrill, chicken teriyaki, and the father, Graham, says, I'm going to have a cheeseburger with bacon, extra bacon. Comfort is a prominent theme in Psalm 41. King David was on a sick bed. No one comforted him. Quite the opposite, his enemies and those who hated him hoped he would never get up from his sick bed. That his enemies would be so comfortless was to be expected. But then there is this in verse 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. No one comforted David. No one on earth, that is. And so David looked to the Lord to be his comforter. You may never be in a distress so lonely that literally no one on earth comforts you. Uh, At least I hope not. The more important takeaway from Psalm 41, however, is this. The Lord is your constant comforter. If others comfort you, that's a bonus, but it's not a necessity. I don't say that to excuse our having compassion upon others. We are urged to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We are to be comforters, but we are also quite fallible. We can be miserable comforters. Never so the Lord, and so look to him first and foremost for your comfort. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, you are the Lord's anointed comforter. And number two, the Lord is your ample comforter. Let's take a look at uh, us being anointed to comfort others. So King David was sick. Glance at verse eight. It says an evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. What do we do when we are sick? Well, we go to the Lord in prayer with our requests. David just uh, does just that, but it begins in verse 4. Before he asked the Lord to heal him, he gave his request a three-verse prologue. It rehearsed his own response when others were in distress. So David says, hey, when people are in distress, this is what I've done. And then he gets into his prayer. 
while he was, or rather, was he trying to earn a healing by pointing to his own good works? I don't think so, especially because he will open his prayer by asking the Lord to be merciful to him. And works and mercy don't really go together. And so why this prologue? Well, I'm sure there are many reasons, but it, it shows us at least two things. First, in their response to David's suffering, the people around him are exposed as hypocrites. And so the sickness was being used by God to reveal the hearts of others. This doesn't necessitate that the Lord caused the sickness, only that he could work with it to make all things work together for the good. And so David was sick as people get sick in the world. Uh, we see that right now. We're all dealing with sickness, right? Whether we have it or not. And God said, well, if you're going to be sick, let's use this uh, to uh, your good and my glory. And second, we must differentiate between the old covenant David was under and our new covenant in Jesus. Under the old, God promised to reward right behavior with physical blessing. David will show that he had behaved righteously toward the sick. Thus, God should bless him physically according to his word. I'll talk more about it, but now under the new covenant, believers in Jesus Christ are not promised physical blessings so much as they are spiritual ones. And so that was a lengthy, but I think necessary prologue to David's prologue. So let's get into these opening three verses. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, blessed is he who considers the poor, the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. Remember, this is a song we sometimes forget as we're in the Psalms and we approach it like we would the analysis of any other letter. Uh, but this is a song. And these first three verses, thinking about that, instead of being a prologue, they maybe were a kind of spoken word introduction. If you're having trouble thinking of a song with a spoken word introduction, I'd recommend later you YouTube one of the last Johnny Cash songs, The Man Comes Around. Anybody heard that song? Johnny Cash, The Man. He's got a, it's apocalyptic, and he's got a really, really chilling spoken word uh, opening about the horsemen coming forth and stuff. And then he gets into the song. And I, obviously I'm speculating, but I can see something like that here in this song. Now, maybe I focus too much on suffering, but the first things I hear in this spoken word are poor, trouble, bed of illness, and sick bed. David did not think it strange that he might be sick. The physical blessings God promised Israel for obedience never meant that an individual couldn't get sick or die. They did mean David could boldly ask for the things he did in these verses, which are consideration, preservation, blessing, strengthening, and sustaining. As for consideration, sometimes your cause is just a matter of getting it before the right person. Uh, whatever you're seeking, if you can just get it before the right authority or the right individual, for sure they will hear your case and uh, you, you know, answer for you. As believers, it isn't a matter of discovering some spiritual secret behavior that is necessary before God will hear us. That's legalism. And unfortunately, even Christians who don't think they're legalistic sometimes fall into this trap thinking, uh, I've been praying, but God isn't answering the way I want him to, so maybe I need to do these things. Uh, maybe I'm not doing my devotions long enough or hard enough or praying long enough or hard enough or whatever it might be. And as Christians, we give this advice sometimes. We, it, the advice based on more of a, what are you doing that is blocking God from giving you mercy? If mercy is not getting what I deserve and grace is getting what I don't deserve, then what, what could possibly be blocking that? God doesn't, you know, look at the, I don't want to get into it, but look at these guys, these characters in the Bible. If you take Daniel and Joseph out of the Bible, everybody else is a crackpot, practically. I mean, you, if you were God, you wouldn't bless any of those guys. Uh, you know, David? I mean, come on. I mean, this guy did so many wrong things and had such a bad heart and yet he's the man after God's own heart. And so uh, we don't earn anything. We, we shouldn't be legalistic. Uh, we're told to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The writer there in Hebrews doesn't say, once you get it all together 
and repent and do everything you can do on your behalf, then you can come boldly to the throne. Then the doors will swing open. I know that veil has been rent once and for all, and you're in the presence of Jesus. As for preservation, here's a quote from Romans. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so that sounds like God has a really strong hand preserving me. As for blessing, I mentioned that our blessings are spiritual. We have, we're told in Ephesians, every spiritual resource in heavenly places at our disposal. We tend to look too much on the now, not so much on what's coming later. We look at now and say, I want a healing. God says, well, uh, later you're going to be in a place where there's no need for healing in heaven. In the meantime, let's learn patient endurance as I take you through this. And let me give you all the grace and mercy that is necessary for you to go through that. And so our blessings are spiritual. Anybody remember now and later candy bars? Anybody who was a now and later? There you go. God bless you. I see, I see that hand. The idea it was a taffy kind of thing, right? Where you, you couldn't eat it all at once, I guess. And so you had some of it now and some later. I'm always looking for an angle. And so I was thinking now and laters might be a good nickname for believers. We are now and laters. Now... We're on the earth going through trials and tribulations in the grace and mercy of the Lord. But later, uh, we have a glorious reward waiting for us. As for strengthening, here are two verses to reflect upon. 2 Corinthians 13, 4. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God. And then 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You'll remember that Paul said that or received that and then said what he said after he would prayed three times for God to take a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, away from him. And by the way, as I, can I digress for a minute? I'll forget where we are, but uh, I'm going to digress. I was thinking about that. Didn't you ever strike you as weird that Paul only prayed three times? What does that even mean? I mean, when I get sick, I pray a million times every day, every minute of every day. So, Lord, did you remember what I was praying for? But anyway, and then I thought maybe it has to do with a, the Jewish uh, side of Paul where he would still go to the temple three times a day for prayer. And maybe he's saying that he went to the temple and prayed three times Maybe he only prayed one day three times and God said, yeah, that's enough. I, I am doing this for your good and my glory. And so that's just, I, just something to tuck away and think about. But God's strength is shown through our weakness in this dispensation. We think God's strength is shown through strength, that he would be best shown through our total healing all the time, that people would go crazy and say, wow, I want to follow that God. But in our reading of the New Testament, we see that Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. What a healing. Man, the guy comes jumping out in his grave clothes saying, woo, 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 woo. Social distance, all covered, you know, anyway. But <laughs> his sister said, that guy's got a stink by now. And he comes jumping out and they unwrap him. And what was the reaction of the Jewish leaders? We have to kill him now and Jesus because we can't have this resurrection stuff ruining our political aspirations. And so the healing isn't what really brings people to the Lord. They just prove that Jesus was the Messiah. And today, God is glorified in our sickness as we give him the glory and magnify him and say, hey, uh, you know, whether God chooses to deliver me through it or in it or from it, that's his business, but I'm going to praise him. Sustaining is the byproduct of the Lord's strengthening. It is the power of Jesus' resurrection uh, that we draw from. Now, David says he comforted the poor, not just people in poverty. The word is broad enough to include all type and manner of suffering. One image I've never really had of David is him doing a hospital visitation or maybe signing a letter for a death notification. Uh, obviously, as the king, he had a lot of duties that we don't normally think about. And I just, I like to flesh out these Bible characters sometime and, and in my own mind and see them as more than just Bible characters, which, uh, you know, and, and see them as so multifaceted. 
But can you imagine, can you imagine being in the hospital, whatever they, or usually I guess you were just on your sick bed at home, and somebody come in and say, well, you have a visitor. Who is it? It's King David. Wow. That would be awesome. But he said, Lord, I did that. As God's anointed king, he expressed the anointing of God by being among the poor. He represented the Lord. As Christians, we use the word anointed usually to describe serving that was accompanied by a strong sense of God, the Holy Spirit, leading it and present in it. If you really want to compliment a ministry, maybe you go up to the person and say, that was really anointed, because that takes all of the burden off of the person and puts it on the Lord. We were just talking about this the other day, uh, me and a couple of people. Because sometimes people, I've done it too, happens rarely to me, but sometimes people come up and say, great study. And I think, you know, if you want to be a blessing to me and to the Lord, say, really anointed. Because that means that you didn't even hear what I said, (laughs) but you heard what the Lord said. And same thing with music or anything else. Hey, that was anointed. I felt God. I sensed God. There was obviously the presence of God in that situation. One more thing, and then I'll be able to make a point out of this. Jesus promised believers that he would send the promise of the Father, which was God, the Holy Spirit, to permanently indwell us. And Jesus called him the Comforter. So here's the point. Every believer, by virtue of the indwelling Holy Spirit, is already anointed to comfort others. And then we learn more about comforting as God comforts us in and through our own troubles on the earth. And so it's not a matter of how much experience you've had. That helps. But by virtue of the fact you are a Christian with the indwelling spirit who is the comforter. I mean, if you have an onboard comforter, then he's able to comfort others. Uh, And you can do that right now with some thoughtfulness and prayer. Maybe you've been asked, what is your superpower? Anybody? It's a thing that's going around right now. People say, well, what's your superpower? Mine is being stupid. But anyway... Publicly, But anyway, it's a thing. Uh, Whatever else you might say, as a believer, if somebody says, what's your superpower? You ought to be able to say, I'm a comforter. What do you mean? The God of all comfort, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, indwells me permanently. And so that makes me a person that's anointed to comfort others. Pretty exciting. The Lord is your ample comforter. One of the early Christian rock guys, Benny Hester, had a song that really struck me as a baby believer. Nobody knows me like you. One of the lines in it, though some know me well, still nobody knows me like you. King David's sickness was compounded by his being abandoned by friends and accused by enemies. He therefore committed himself to the one person who truly knew him, to the one he knew loved him with an everlasting love, to the one who would never, ever leave him or forsake him. And so let's listen to the lyrics of David's sickbed song. Verse 4, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. The Old Covenant promised blessings for obedience. David, however, didn't demand what was promised there. He appealed to God's mercy. God's law was never intended to promote a legalistic relationship with God. Love was always the basis of fellowship. And so even though David did all the things he talked about in the first three verses, he didn't say, God, I've done this, so therefore you must do this for me. He said, Lord, I've done this, and be merciful to me now and reciprocate by healing me. David said, I have sinned. He doesn't seem to be confessing any particular sin. He was acknowledging he was a sinner. And you say, well, sure, we all acknowledge that we're sinners. But I've had this happen over the years in For example, marriage counseling, husband and wife are in there together. And they'll readily say, man, I am such a sinner. And then they insist, selfishly, that nothing in the relationship is their fault. And I'll say something like, well, I thought you were a sinner. I go, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm not committing any open sin. I say, except for the selfishness of that last statement. That's usually the end of the session. But anyway, I'll tell you the key to marriages. You're selfish. And when you quit being selfish, you won't have any problems. I'm serious. Anyway, so if you're a sinner, own it. Say, yeah, I'm a sinner, and a lot of this is my fault, and so let's work this out. Heal my soul reminds us that our spirit is in priority over our body. 
Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And so God is building us up, uh, using the bodies that we have, sometimes through illness, uh, to build up our spiritual man or woman. For us, Heal My Soul is a precious reminder of what we think about the doctrine of salvation, because that is the ultimate healing. The moment you believe Jesus, you are saved. You are born again. The Holy Spirit permanently indwells you. From that precious moment forward, for the rest of your life on the earth, you are being saved as you are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We call this ongoing process, the Bible calls it, sanctification. And when you're resurrected or raptured and you have your new forever body, your salvation is obviously complete, and this we call glorification. By the way, the doctrine of salvation is also known as soteriology. I only tell you that so you can not be tripped up by people who like to sound more uh, impressive than you. My, somebody, if somebody comes up to me and says, what's your soteriology? I'd be tempted to say I'm an Italian-American. <laughs> Sounds like a genealogical question, but uh, it's just the Greek word for salvation, uh, soteriology, and so don't get tripped up. Verse 5, my enemies speak evil of me. When will he die and his name perish? And if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me, they devise my hurt. An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. Regarding these people who came to see David, one commentator pointed out the following, and I quote, The word me is not in the original. Perhaps the idea is not that he came to see the sufferer, but that he came to see for himself though under pretense of paying a visit of kindness. His real motive was to make observation that he might find something in the expressions or manner of the sufferer that would enable him to make a good report, or rather a report unfavorable to him, and to confirm him in his impression that it was desirable that David should die. He would come under the mask of sympathy and friendship, but really to find something that would confirm him in the opinion that David was bad and that would enable him to state to others that it was desirable David should die. So we're calling these people frenemies uh, because they came visiting David, but it was a pretense. These individuals wished David would die. They justified it by thinking he deserved it. Let's just say that such thoughts are not consistent with compassion, and therefore they render a person, oh, totally unlike their Lord. Verse 9, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Many of the Psalms, which were all written before the time of Jesus, contain details that prophesied of events in his life. This verse prophesied something that happened later with Jesus. As explained in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, one of his 12, on the night before he was crucified. And he quoted, not all, but from this verse. Scholars give various answers to just how many prophecies Jesus fulfilled in his life and death and resurrection. The number 300 keeps popping up, and so it seems reasonable. A guy named Peter Stoner looked at the odds of any man fulfilling just 48 of the 300 plus or minus prophecies. I don't know why he chose the number 48, but it maybe works out better mathematically for him. The chance of any man fulfilling these prophecies even down to the present time, would be 1 in 10 to the 157th power, which means it's impossible. And so uh, we talk a lot about prophecy here and fulfilled prophecy, if for no other reason than it absolutely proves, not that we need proof as Christians, but it absolutely proves that the Bible is the word of God because it is impossible for these prophecies to be fulfilled uh, unless they are divinely fulfilled. And that's just 48 prophecies about Jesus, not the 2,500 prophecies that are in the Bible. Neither Jesus nor David, however, was giving a lesson in Bible prophecy. These just weren't off-the-cuff statements. These words proceeded from great emotion. They were being abandoned in the worst way. And Jesus was drawing from this, not just to prophesy, but the way we look at the Psalms and pick out words and verses from the Psalms that bring us comfort. And so the Lord, having memorized the Psalms, obviously, uh, and maybe even sang this verse when he shared it at the Last Supper, uh, to encourage his own heart. 
It's interesting, the, the uh, phrase lifted up his heel is an expression that means kicked in the face by an animal. That's how these men, David and Jesus, felt. Their betrayal was as if being kicked in the face. Some of you, well, of course, we're in an ag area here, but when I lived in San Bernardino, we had an interesting situation on Golden Avenue where we lived. Right across the street, it was zoned county. And so there was a farm and a ranch across the street. The Prentices owned it. They had all kinds of animals. They had the meanest Shetland pony ever to live, but, you know, this little pony would bite me like crazy. But anyway, one day their donkey was out, and um, my, uh, our side was city, and so my neighbor, Mr. Merritt, who claimed to be an old ranch hand, farm boy kind of a guy, he said he'd take care of it, he'd get it back into the stall for them, and he immediately goes behind the donkey and starts pushing it from the rear. I don't know how he lived, I really don't. This donkey just went off on him, kicking him in the chest and then in the head. It was awful. Uh, he got up and just went home and left the donkey where it was. And I don't know if I ever saw him again after that. But anyway, <laughs> but this is the kind of thing that these guys, Jesus said, I feel like I've just been kicked in the face by a donkey because my familiar friend, in his case, Judas, had, a, uh, had betrayed him. What comfort he must have de derived. I mean, we picture David, Jesus, of course, he was the son of God. You know, we, we think of him sitting around saying, okay, uh, yeah, in a few minutes, Psalm uh, 41.9 is going to be fulfilled. Check that one off. He loved Judas. And he, it, it, this hurt in the worst possible way. And he said, here's a scripture that can encourage me. My father knew this was going to happen. And he's put this here for me. And, you know, so that's what I love when a lot of times I'll tell people they'll seek advice or counsel or comfort. And one of the most comforting things you can do is say, hey, has God given you a scripture yet? Has he pointed you to something in the word? Because that's where your real comfort is going to come from. Rather than think of being abandoned, you know, we get to this point, people say, well, now there was that time, you know, as a pastor, I was lonely and all that. And that's, that's fine, I guess. But... I think it's better to apply it to yourself as a potential abandoner. Uh, I mean, who cares if I've been abandoned? I mean, God got me through it, right? But I don't want to be on the other end of that. I don't want to kick anybody in the teeth. And so I want to make sure that I'm on board. I want to be able to say, you've got a friend to people. Verse 10, but you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. Mercy is our certain hope. God won't give those who love him what they deserve. What every human deserves is the wages from their sin, which is eternal conscious suffering in hell. By his death on the cross as our substitute, no believer gets what they deserve. That I may repay them sounds vengeful, but don't forget that David was not just a simple believer. He was king and had final authority. What some of these people were doing was treason, and he would have responsibility to deal with their treason officially. Hopefully he did it without vengeance and without vindictiveness, but it was up to him. Verse 11, by this I know that you are well pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. In David's case, God would raise him from his sickbed and it would become tangible proof that his accusers were wrong. It was a little Job in David's life. Neither, uh, excuse me, for us victory is fiery furnace victory. It is God's decision to deliver from the fiery furnace or in it. Uh, and so we're not looking for, you know, I always use Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's what I'm referring to there. I, I don't know. I've, it, I repeat it so often, you should be able to repeat it as well. Thrown into the fire. They tell Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to obey you. God will deliver us through the furnace or we'll die. But either way, we're not going to obey you. And that's, that's the kind of victory that Christians have. The Lord allowed James to be beheaded in the New Testament. But Peter was sprung from prison, keeping his head, as it were. Why? Uh, Gino was teaching on this on Wednesday night, and commentators, you know, assume that the church didn't pray effectively for James. But then after they saw that he got his head cut off and, and it was their fault, as it were, they prayed more effectively for Peter. The text doesn't say that anywhere at all. That's some stupid conclusion that theologians come to. I'll tell you that the church, the church was on fire at that time. They were praying for James, and he got his head cut off, and I'm sure it discouraged them. And then they did pray fervently for Peter. Instead of getting discouraged, nobody said, ah, why bother praying for Peter? Our prayers didn't do anything for James. I'm going to stay home and watch the game. 
But instead they prayed and, and God did it. And so which one is victory? Well, I, I personally, you know, I would rather be James, to tell you the truth. One quick slice and you're in heaven. You're back home where you belong. Peter had a long and difficult life, ultimately crucified upside down as far as church history is concerned. Verse 12, as for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. God raised David from his sickbed, restored him, and by it exposed the hypocrites. In the New Testament, we have an odd verse in 1 Corinthians 11, which says, there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Similar to David, God can show who is in the wrong by permitting things to play out. Division doesn't bring God glory. What these people were doing to David doesn't bring God glory. But as it played out, uh, you see who's approved and who's disapproved, who's right and who's wrong. David, as we do, looked forward to being set before God's face forever. This forever worldview of the believer must affect all of our thinking and deciding. And then verse 13, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. In the story of this song, David was still on his sickbed when he made this exclamation of praise. Thoughts of heaven will do that for you. When you are suffering, sure, you'll praise the Lord for his goodness and greatness. That makes sense. But you need to have your heart set on home, maybe even more so if you are prospering. It is times of blessing that make you soft and susceptible to drifting away from the Lord. If we learn anything from Israel uh, in the promised land, especially during the time of the judges, is that when God blessed them the most, they drifted away the farthest. And so maybe, maybe you don't need comfort this morning. Maybe you've got it going. This is a time in your life when you're physically pretty good. Uh, emotionally, you're on board. You've got all the finances you need. You're not in danger of running out of toilet paper anytime soon. All of those things are working for you. Uh, you need the Lord even more to come alongside of you and to comfort you and to uh, bless you. Uh, certainly, if you're in a time of stress and, and all, the Lord wants to comfort you as well. But beware of times of blessing. When people look for comfort, they often seek out those who have had similar sufferings. They're told to find a group. What's your problem? Whatever it is, find the group that deals with that so that you can all commiserate with one another. And, and there is a, a help in that. Uh, seeing that someone else has gone through what you're going through and they've gotten through it and uh, knowing that someone else sort of understands when your average friend doesn't. I mean, I don't want to be little groups like that, but I do want to emphasize this. The person who has had similar sufferings is Jesus. And you might as well just go to him. Hebrews, do we believe this? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have a high priest, don't we, who does sympathize with us and is tempted as we are, but he didn't sin. And we can therefore come to his throne and he'll give us grace and mercy. So here's the thing. Again, groups, I don't want to belittle any group. But at the end of the day, if nobody shares Christ with you at that group, they can't help you get over what it is that you're struggling with. Because what you need is spiritual. What you need is grace and mercy. Those things only come from a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and I'm not saying you're wasting your time, but it can be a diversion. If I prefer the comfort of individuals, especially individuals who aren't born again, to the comfort of the Lord, I submit that there's something wrong with me, that I don't have the faith to believe what I believe. And so go to the Lord. Jesus really is ample for you. We tell people, go, point them to the Lord, go to the Lord. It sounds so ethereal. It sounds so fake. But this is what we're talking about. We're saying, hey, your problems can only be solved at the cross of Jesus Christ. There isn't help in psychology or psychotherapy or philosophy or sociology or any other ology. You need Christ and him crucified, and he is with you always. There, there's no, you don't go once a week or twice a week, or you don't have to find meetings in different cities. He is your onboard comforter. The comforter lives in you. People are good. We are anointed to comfort others. 
It is part of the equation, but nobody knows you like Jesus.